Uh, I want to acknowledge with gratitude that we're hosting this session on the unceded and ancestral territory of the Coast Salish peoples that includes the territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh Nations, and the Métis Charter Community of the Lower Mainland Region. And each of you around this province uh, is coming from uh, your territory, and we encourage you in the interest and uh, spirit of truth and reconciliation to learn as much as you can about the territory in which you live. Next slide. So um, this is the title of today's talk, but I'm going to start to share my screen. Is that all right, Brenda? Uh, can you see that? Somebody put their hand up? Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually go through today where we are with vaccination status, but importantly, update you with respect to a, an exciting initiative. This is a collaborative effort with Ontario and uh, the Canadian Immunization Task Force, fondly referred to as SITF. Um, but I cannot have done any of this without a lot of help from the people that you see listed here. Lee Er, um, Atika Tikisman, uh, Cynthia McDonald, Umer Khan, Mel Krajden from the BCCDC, Mark Romney from Infectious Diseases, Agnanka Duderev, and many, many others around the province. So um, it's important that um, I recognize all of these people. And really, this is work on everyone's behalf. Oops, sorry about that. So the important thing that I want to start with is I'm not an expert in immunological responses or methodologies related to vaccination, but I certainly learned a lot in the last uh, five months, shall I say, or six months uh, with respect to our populations, clinically exceptionally vulnerable and others. I will recall for many of you that in 2003, we described a graded unresponsiveness to hepatitis B vaccine in chronic kidney disease patients and identified a threshold of about 20 mils per minute. And that was something that we did with when Gerald DeRoe Rosa was a resident, um, so that will tell you a, a sense of how long ago that was, um, and that immunizing people earlier is better. Um, we're all interested in making sure that we learn the most from this pandemic and how to best treat our patients, and so uh, understanding vaccination in uh, the current group, knowing what we know about hepatitis B, I think is critical. My overarching objective for this talk is to ensure that BC patients and all of us as their healthcare providers have a maximal opportunity to contribute to new knowledge. Um, that's in the context of this COVID-19 vaccination rollout and to stimulate interest and patient enrollment over the next two to six weeks. And as you can imagine, time is of the essence here. Uh, and due to a number of uh, logistic and other issues, uh, the timeliness of Health Canada, um, CITF, understanding announcements and uh, being able to roll things out, including ethics boards has not been super uh, helpful, but we do really need to uh, understand and move forward. So what I'm going to do is give you an overview as a province of where we are with vaccination activity, which is really terrific, uh, give you a background or maybe the context of vaccine responsiveness in our population, and then describe to you our collaboration with Ontario and, C uh, and Canadian Immunization Task Force and some of the things that we've been asked to do with the serology study um, and um, vaccination effectiveness study. So important timestamps in this province, and remember that every province has its own context because waves happen at different times. Um, so our overall pandemic period started on March 17th and up until the present, wave one is classically defined until October, wave two is October, mid-October to mid-March, wave three is mid-March to um, mid-May, and then we reopened BC and we are currently in wave four, as you all know. This is the number of patients um, in the uh, stat in the bars in those with kidney disease, uh, non-dialysis kidney disease, facility-based hemo, home-based hemo, and transplant who actually uh, became COVID positive over the year up until September fifth by modality. The infection rate per hundred thousand patient days is is in the um, orange two point four seven point eight two. 3.11 and 6.30, uh, and this is over the total time. So this is uh, independent of vaccine status, as you can imagine. So 
Overall, and compared to other provinces, we've done very well in protecting our patients from getting COVID-19, uh, but important that we still do have infections, as you see. This is the vaccination status as of September 5th, so this is to totally hot off the press, uh, presses. So overall, CKD patients in the province is 25,000 uh, as written, and 84.6% of them have had are fully vaccinated, 3.8 have only had one dose. Um, in terms of uh, clinical, clinically exceptionally vulnerable people, that's a general population um, that is uh, similar as is the non-CEV, non-stage five uh, pre-dialysis patients. So that's everybody who doesn't have uh, kidney failure. So by CEV populations, uh, it looks like we're doing still very, very well in terms of fully vaccinated, so over 84%. If you look at um, each of the different populations, you can see the trend of vaccination where uh, first doses were rolled out starting in March, uh, and then the majority of people really by now have had two doses. So fully vaccinated is the purple and green is the first dose only. So you can see the dialysis, the kidney transplant, the stage five, the uh, non-dialysis population, and then the rest of people um, who irrespective of kidney function and on immunosuppression, so mostly our GN patients, uh, you can see that everyone has done quite well in terms of being fully vaccinated. Now, what's interesting is that unlike um, perhaps other provinces, which I'll show you in a moment, we have a mixture of vaccines. So we have the majority of people got Pfizer, uh, a lesser amount, this is now by uh, populations, dialysis, transplant, non um, stage five, non-dialysis, uh, non-stage five GN, and then everybody who is not a GN but registered as pre-dialysis. So you'll see about 70% uh, of people got Pfizer, uh, a smaller group got Moderna, and then a smaller group again got mixed um, Moderna and Pfizer in different orders. This will become important in a moment. So this is just looking at it in a, in a bigger lump. You can see that uh, there's still a significant proportion of people who have Pfizer, then Moderna, then mixed. If you look by health authority, there's even more variation in the mixing and the Moderna and Pfizer, and that has to do with availability of vaccine at different points in time. Um, so this is a, just the same graph showing you distribution of vaccine brands by modality by health authority. So mixed vaccine populations are of high interest, and I'll, I'll show you why shortly, but this is, and thanks to Lee for all of her hard work to pull all this together for me at relatively short notice, um, but this is uh, the number of people of those with mixed vaccines, what order and what people got uh, relatively, and so you're not really meant to read this, but to see that of those people that had two doses, non-dialysis, PD, and hemo, they're variable mixtures, with the majority of people getting Pfizer first and Moderna second uh, of the people that got mixed doses. So that's where we are in this province with respect to vaccination. So A, we're doing really well. B, we don't have a lot of um, infection. But importantly, we need to understand the whole, the totality of what vaccine responsiveness actually means. And there are a number of dialysis studies that have been done to date looking at detection of antibodies. And they're in relatively small groups that here, this is something compiled as in uh, NEFJC as of May, 2021. And I've got some updated ones, but basically they're very small ends, but people describing the uh, decreased responsiveness of hemodialysis patients in specific. So this is a graph that we're going to get very used to looking at. So um, basically, this looks at healthcare workers and dialysis patients um, who did not have any evidence of SARS uh, or COVID-19 infection at both prior to three to four weeks and eight weeks post vaccine. And there's really um, a lack of responsiveness to vaccine in hemodialysis patients uh, up to eight weeks. And this is after one dose. This is one of the initial studies uh, published. 
Um, there, there's a nice study out of the group at Stanford, uh, Musushi Anand and Pablo Garcia, looking at vaccine type and humoral response. And the point of this slide, again, is not to get into the weeds, but rather to look at that fact that there is variable response to different vaccines by modality and at different time points, be that 14 to 18 days or 28 to 60 days. This is in uh, a um, in the dialysis uh, center group that they have at Stanford, which includes home in center uh, and has various mixes of vaccines. Um, this is a nice review in Journal of Personalized Medicine, looking at all the data to date um, and concluding that the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines was lesser and more delayed in people on maintenance hemodialysis than in healthy controls in different clinical settings less than half of the dialysis patients have a positive antibody response after they got one dose. The predictors in the totality of these studies are younger age, previous infection, and higher serum albumin levels that favored antibody formation and are older, and those receiving immunosuppressive therapies were negatively associated. So I think that is uh, sort of where the state of the world is. Now, this is a small study just published in JAMA from our colleagues at Sunnybrook. This is 142 patients um, in the hemodialysis unit looking at response at one dose and two dose uh, to anti-spike, uh, anti-receptor binding domain and anti-nucleocapsid protein, um, looking at the, the various responsiveness. And I think this is an interesting study uh, compared to uh, healthcare workers. Um, and just to give you a sense of what this looks like. So this is pre-dose levels at dose one at uh, plus four weeks, pre-dose two, dose two at one, plus one week, plus two weeks and four weeks. This is the seroconversion threshold this is what convalescent serum looks like. And what you can see here is a splay in the response um, to the vaccine by 100, in 142 dialysis patients after one and two doses at variable time points. Um, and so this is a bit of a problem um, given that we're trying to protect our patients, if you will. Now, those of you um, more sophisticated than I or all of us will remember that there's two components to immunity, humoral and cellular, and there are different methods. Most of the vaccine studies to date have most published on humoral immunity, and that's what we're continuing to focus on. But we're well aware that there are various uh, methods by which to measure and which may confer uh, equal benefit if one looks at cellular immunity. But many studies are, are actually underway and the Canadian Immunization Task Force has actually set up all a number of studies and funded us to be able to understand the totality of the response. So what we've come up with in a very short period of time was a collaboration with Ontario uh, funded by the Canadian Immunization Task Force to do a COVID-19 serology study. So these submissions were done in March and April. Um, the first meeting of the group was in, 20, was in May, uh, on May 25th. And between then and now, we've been working very hard to make sure that we get all of our ducks in a row. And that includes immunologists, methodologists, epidemiologists, vaccine experts, infectious disease experts, and uh, nephrologists uh, trying very hard to see what we can do and where we can get to. So the rationale is that we know that the infections, when they do occur in dialysis or kidney patients are severe, often leading uh, to hospitalizations and mortality. We know from previous work that um, has been done some in this province and in other places that we have suboptimal responses to traditional vaccines. And so what we're going to do is in Ontario and Quebec, because we have well-established renal agencies that already track COVID-19 infections and vaccinations and rich data sources, so the ORS and PROMISE, we're able to identify patients, look at risk factors and measure outcomes. And so for that reason, CTIF actually asked us um, to come together and do this study. But of course, like everything, it takes a little while to get it off the ground. So the goal of this study, if you will, this observational study is to determine the serological response to COVID-19 vaccines. Doses one and two and three after, uh, we'll show you the boost protocol approval in people with CKD, looking at people with GFRs of less than 45, um, both in terms of serological response and the safety of vaccination. 
So the patient populations include hemo, both in-center, uh, home dialysis, PD, uh, CKD patients from 3B down. Transplant patients were not excluded from um, the goal, but there were a number of other transplant studies going on, so we didn't presume to include them in the first instance. Uh, we're going to look at anti-spike, anti-receptor binding domain, and anti-nucleocapsid protein, fondly known as anti-RBD and anti-NP antigens, and also people who develop COVID-19 during the observational period, also looking at viral variants and whole genome sequencing. The initial, and I think you can see this uh, breakdown for enrollment for the 2,500 people that we would follow, and you'll remember the other studies that I showed you have like 142 and 85, um, was Ontario was going to um, enroll 1250 and we were going to enroll 1250. Uh, due to some changes and some delays, we may enroll less hemo and more PD and CKD, but we'll get to that in a moment. The recommended time points, because the Canadian Immunization Task Force wants some comparability, both across different populations, as well as um, across countries, because everyone's quite committed to understanding vaccination responsiveness um, in a very sharing way. They wanted prior to first dose, uh, prior to second dose, and then three, six, and 12 months after the second dose. And if you miss the first time point, which as you can tell from uh, the this, this things that I showed you, we'll just go to the next time point. Our current state and recent publication makes some of the time points that we initially talked about modifiable and maybe emphasizing different populations that have not been previously reported, like home therapies patients and chronic kidney disease patients. There are some additional immunological studies that are going to be done to assess humoral and cellular response. And uh, in whom will we do these additional studies is going to depend on resources, accessibility, and readiness. And the details of that are under discussion. Like everything in COVID, this is completely a moving target. And we're uh, continually feeling like we're scrambling to get this done and dusted. We will look at memory B cell response and cellular immunity with PBMCs, um, and that is again under discussion and vary by province. Where we are is we uh, got harmonized REB, which is uh, Research Ethics Board approval in July. That's only six weeks ago, eight weeks ago. We have operational approvals at each of the different health authorities pending Fraser. We've begun to connect with nurses and lab staff for logistics. And there are a lot of logistics, even though this is intended to be a very simple serological study. We're um, collaborating strongly with BCCDC and Mel Krasden and the BC COVID Biobank Network in an attempt to make sure that we actually have the samples that we need to do, not just the basic study, but additional studies as well. So vaccination occurred, it's not actually not necessarily more quickly than the study initially conceived, but based on the timelines when we put in for the study versus um, when we got all the approvals, that's what happened. So the assessment between the first and second dose is not so novel, nor are there many left who have not uh, had a second dose, as you can see by the data that I showed you. But in order for us to add to the existing literature in a meaningful way, we need to identify the patient groups and circumstances that have not yet been studied or published. So we have sites in BC and Ontario, we have which give different ethnic mixes as well as um, different timing of waves and different processes in place. We have vaccination type and combinations, which are novel, and we have specific populations of interest, be they CKD, perineal dialysis patients, those on and off immunosuppressive, whether they have kidney transplants or not. And so those are groups of people who have not yet been well studied in literature in whom we have a fair amount of data and therefore opportunity. So we had initially thought about 1,500 people with two to 300 people per health authority. But as we, as I've just alluded to, we think that maybe a practical approach would be to identify those from whom we can identify the most novel information and look at those who've got mixed dose vaccines, um, focusing especially on PD and CKD and immunocompromised. Um, 
we are ensuring that the research nurses and coordinators at each of the renal programs in every health authority will help to identify people in clinic, discuss the procedures and consent patients. But again, that requires some logistics and between summer holidays, vacations and uh, virtual things that has been um, a bit slow, but also we only just got approval in many ways. We do, um, and I welcome Umer Khan, who's our provincial coordinator. So um, we'll be able to actually do a number of different interesting things, including e-consenting. We're talking about mailing out um, a provincial um, uh, mail out for prioritizing who still have uh, who have not yet had dose two, it's a small number and that may be able to allow us to identify uh, a novel group of people. And we have a number of different consenting options, be they in person, e-consenting via web link or QR code, phone or Zoom. And I think that's again, a novel uh, way that we really reduce the burden um, of any of the different units of consenting if in fact um, we can do it by these different methods. So basically, we're going to try and identify patients uh, with the help of clinical providers, patient letters, um, the profiles that we can generate from Promise, the informed consent process um, is either in person or e-consent. Uh, we have the three different groups. There are the people who have not yet been vaccinated, those with one dose and those with two doses. And this is the um, proposed schedule. This is the hemo schedule and this is the non-hemodialysis schedule. It's more, um, it's to try and mimic uh, the clinical visits, et cetera. Importantly, uh, we're looking at both blood samples and dried blood kits. This is a novel way to collect information. These are kits that are prepared. BCCDC has been doing a number of studies around the province with this, as have other provinces where the patients receive this little kit, um, which is uh, important, which uh, has a dried blood spot in it. They have a little video and they're told how to a sample uh, just using a finger prick and then they put the dry blood sample into a, an envelope with a special sachet which is good for preservation for two weeks and put it in a, a self address an envelope addressed to uh, us here in uh, in Vancouver so that we can then process that sample and this is uh, really avoids blood draws uh, and is a reliable methodology by which to collect not just samples for this but for other things as well and it's really a, a novel technology and will help us we think to get a lot of people people um, who may not want to go for extra venipuncture or going to the lab and trying to organize things with life labs or the hospital labs, although that is also an option. There's a number of proposed additional nested studies because obviously when you start to have 3000 people with variable ethnicity uh, and characteristics, we can now look at predictors of response um, because there are people who do respond well. We'll be able to look at waning immunity uh, and when that happens in different groups of people, we'll be able to compare vaccines. Uh, and there's some preliminary data that already suggests that Moderna is superior to Pfizer uh, in our population. Um, we'll look at GFR strata as we did with the hepatitis B. Um, and there's the opportunity, which I'll come to in a moment, about booster studies, both observational because some people have already either mistakenly or intentionally received a third dose. And there's also um, a new plan for a randomized controlled trial. We'll be able to look at breakthrough infections as well. So the next steps for the observational cohort study is to identify the patients according to modality, number of doses administered, and prioritize those who had a mixed dose because that will help us add to our knowledge in a really meaningful way quickly. And as you saw from the initial slides, that's about um, 14 to 17% of any uh, modality. So that's actually quite a, a large number uh, in the end, about three or 400 if I remember correctly. The observational cohort study is foundational to understanding the biology of the, our vaccination response to inform care, especially as we go in uh, to this next uh, phase of, uh, of COVID-19, but also for enrollment into the new BOOST study. Um, the BC team, the first contacts have been done through the medical directors of each of the health authorities listed here, and they've identified uh, the, patient, the patient care managers who are most responsible for the various areas, and in some cases also um, site 
uh, site leads that are clinicians. And obviously the next steps is to socialize this um, so that we actually get a really um, ex excitement around the province to be able to uh, really gear up and do this because it, it is actually a simple study once we get going and many of the patients have already been asking uh, in, clinical in clinical encounters as to how they could measure their antibody response to the vaccine. So this is a way to do it. And we will get the results so we'll be able to feed them back. This is Cynthia Numer's contact uh, information. Um, I'll make that available to anybody uh, after the talk as well. You can email us, um, but important um, that we really get behind this uh, and we can hopefully, I'll have a lot of time for discussion in a moment. So literally <laughs> one week ago, Health Canada approved a, a regulated study called uh, for vaccine boosters in the kidney population. Now that is a first ever, and that's thanks to Michelle Haladowicz. So we obtained extra vaccine doses. It's a multi-center randomized controlled trial of 300 people that's blinded. Um, the patients who are included are those who are, did not zero convert or had very low teeters and who received the same Pfizer or Moderna in two doses. The primary outcome will be anti-RBD uh, and anti-spike levels, and we're also going to look at safety and adverse events. Uh, the booster vaccine will be the same one as they got for their initial, be it Moderna or Pfizer, but it'll, if there's no um, there's no control. Um, you either sorry, th there is a control, so it's it's uh, Moderna or Pfizer, and the serum sampling time points. Uh, in a subgroup will include cellular immune response and um, other measures. Whoops, a daisy. So this is uh, Michelle's uh, thought that this was important for us to do. This is a lot of work to get it done and approved by Health Canada. It will allow uh, regulatory, um, it will, it's a regulatory study, so it's a highly, um, what shall I say, um, it's pretty intense to monitor it properly, so it will require a lot of bandwidth. Um, it's answering the question of in patients with low antibody levels, can a third dose increase their levels? And does a different COVID-19 vaccine for the third dose give a better immune response with tolerable adverse effects? Some of you will know the Moderna vaccine is um, much bigger dose than the Pfizer vaccine. So um, we have to blind the patients when they get the uh, those because they'll be able to see from the size of the syringe, um, which one they're getting. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so you enroll, the, once we identify these patients, um, they those who had two doses of Pfizer or two doses of Moderna then get either one of the other. So there's no control other than the fact that you get the opposite or the same of what you got originally, if you have low levels. Um, so these are, the patients will be identified by having their levels drawn one month following their second COVID-19 vaccine, looking at anti-spike, RBD, and NP. Um, and all of the testing is gonna be done at Mount Sinai. So this is gonna be mostly based um, so all the tests will be sent to Mount Sinai. So that will require expedited um, ethics review in BC because believe it or not, shipping samples to Ontario for a study like this will require uh, a lot of interprovincial um, approvals and um, which for something like this are often uh, can be done, but we need to make sure that we get on this quickly. Um, the allocation will be administered two to 12 months after the second dose. So that amount means that most people are eligible and it allows the people from the observational cohort um, to actually be screened and entered into this study. And the vaccine will be come from wherever it usually comes from. There'll be concealed allocation. So that makes it again a bit more complicated and we'll have to work at the one or two sites in BC that would be capable of doing this because um, of familiarity or readiness to do this. So, and then there's uh, the usual five mils um, of uh, serum that's uh, required to do these studies. And then um, there's some details. This all comes from the training um, slides that Michelle put together uh, two days ago. And the planned analysis is basically the, um, 
the receptor binding domain um, antibody levels at 30 days, and there's a number of secondary analyses. So that's where we are with vaccination activity. We know that people don't respond. We are going to do this serological study, which is simple, but still requires a lot of work in terms of maximizing the patients who are going to recruit. And we're going to hopefully do these, this booster study. But many of you will also know that vaccine effectiveness is not necessarily measured simply um, by what your antibody response is. So you need a vaccine effectiveness study because you need to figure out the real world performance with respect to preventing infections. So what we need to do in this in our populations is to evaluate that effectiveness in our pop. We know that herd immunity and we know that, pop that vaccinating the population is a value, but in our subgroup, um, for example, CKD, dialysis, people living with HIV, how well does this vaccine protect either in the context of their antibody response or, other, or, or cellular responses? Um, and, or does it not have anything to do with those responses and still protect? So we can evaluate effectiveness also against variants of concern, the duration of protection, and to look at evidence for conditionally approved other products. So these are the reasons that one does vaccine effectiveness studies. W the World Health Organization recommends that, um, that the most feasible outcome for a vaccine effectiveness study is uh, looking at RT-PCR confirmed COVID-19 infections. That would be the, the ultimate test of. And so there are study designs, which I'm not going to go into because I'm not an expert in this, but thank you, Atik, for putting all this together to look at how one looks at um, vaccine effectiveness with text test negative design, cohort studies, case control, and case population methods. So we are, it's complicated because every vaccine effectiveness uh, assessment has to be done in the context of the province or the country in which you live, the wave in which you are. And so there are a number of complexities um, that we need to take into account. One is that um, whether or not we have enough people with two doses, um, for a long enough time? Um, do we have enough outcomes? I showed you how, how low our numbers were at any time point in terms of infections in our populations and what covariates you need to actually help understand this that may or may not be captured in any of our data sets. There's a number of different um, biases when you look at effectiveness studies and they include um, confounding by healthcare seeking behavior. So if, you, if you're sick, you don't go to the doctor, then we'll never know if you, and we won't test you for COVID-19, therefore we won't know that you did or you didn't have it. There's misclassification of the exposure, the outcome, and whether or not you had a previous infection. So there's a huge need for an experienced epidemiological and statistical team and dedicated staff. Um, and I think that this is uh, exactly what the team that we've assembled both in BC as well as in Ontario is working on now. The funding to do this has been obtained through Canadian Immunization Task Force. So um, it is no small feat to pull all this information together and to do this in a robust way. Uh, the ORN, Ontario Renal Network, has done a preliminary um, pass at this, looking at um, the protection of their dialysis cohort. We have the opportunity in the context of the two provinces to look at the totality of the CKD population. So it's in progress. We're going to do a combined analysis and a validation cohort with BC. As you can appreciate, BC is much smaller in terms of our kidney populations than Ontario. We're gonna look at a prevalent cohort of dialysis and of non-dialysis patients. And given the context of our provinces are different in terms of both severity and timing of our waves, as well as our vaccine rollout timing and strategies. So our in, the interval between doses in Ontario was much shorter than it was in BC, and they have no mixed doses in Ontario, whereas we do. So that gives us some compare and contrast um, abilities, which actually makes this uh, super interesting and of value to the communities around the world. So what we need to do is to increase the awareness of our patients and providers of the fact that we're involved in these important studies. We 
plan also that this is not a um, we know things and and we want you to help us know more because we want people to understand the meaning of tests, the purpose of the study, and then manage expectations. So explaining to people the results of their studies and that lack of full immune response doesn't mean that you're not protected, sorry about the double negatives, uh, is also important. And so working on some patient um, facing materials um, so that when the results come back, we have consistent ways to explain this to people um, so that we're providing the results to patients uh, in relative real time with an explanation. And then obviously when the study is done, we're gonna to have to explain to everyone, including the patients, what the results show. Um, and that's why it's important to do both the serological study, ideally the small boost study, but also the vaccination effectiveness study, all kind of in tandem where time is of the essence to be able to really um, inform um, both practice as well as uh, people who are uh, notably incredibly anxious. So the next steps are to identify the interested patients and begin consenting, um, identify the strategy to enroll and begin the blood sample draws or the DBKs uh, based on the patient characteristics. Our suggestion is to think about the not fully vaccinated, the mixed vaccine regimen, those on and off immunosuppressive agents with chronic kidney disease and PD patients, which would um, make it um, uh, very novel. And there are some other studies underway in the transplant population, but um, certainly there's nothing stopping our patients being in it. And some of our patients will get transplanted between vaccines or um, post-vaccination. And so what um, should stay uh, in, our, in the study, um, be it observational or other. So with that, uh, at eight minutes after eight, I will uh, stop sharing my screen and open it up to uh, questions or thoughts um, from you, the audience. And again, um, I wanna thank uh, Lee and Atik and Cynthia Numer and Anyenka and everyone who worked uh, so hard to pull all this uh, stuff together. And of course, the medical directors and each of the health authorities who've been supportive of doing this. And uh, it's been a whirlwind in the last really um, four to six weeks trying to get all the ducks in a row so that we could get to here. So um, I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. You can either raise your hand and um, people will unmute you or you can put it in the chat box. Does that make sense? There are 53 of you, so does nobody have any questions? Okay, so coming uh, to a place near you, um, we will uh, be talking to the various people and reaching out through the medical directors um, of the health authorities to uh, each of you. I hope that you found the information useful. I think uh, we've done an amazing job of keeping our patients safe. Uh, the rates of, um, of uh, infection are still incredibly low per million pop per 100,000 population and relative to other provinces. So congratulations um, for that. And just keep scrolling to see if anyone has any other questions. Okay. Thank you for joining and thank you for your attention. And if you do have any questions, please um, just send me an email and um, we'll be in touch. And so if you see people um, coming forward to figure out how we're best going to enroll some groups of patients, and if your patients are interested, please feel free to talk this up. Okay, thanks everybody.